Welcome to Foss North, the virtual edition. We would like to thank all our sponsors and partners in this difficult situation. Our gold sponsors, Luxoft and Ansible by Red Hat. Our silver sponsors, ITRS Group and Make It Right. Our base sponsors, our partner projects, the open source community and the region of Gothenburg. And a huge thanks to our awesome community. This would not have been possible without you. Today we're happy to uh, to start FOSS North, the virtual edition. Uh, and first out of all our brave speakers is Christopher Grönlund, who will be introducing Rook to us. So I'm handing over the, the view to him now. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Uh, yes, so I will be introducing Rook and telling you what it is and what it's useful for. Uh, my name is Christoph Grenland. I work for SUSE and uh, I work in the storage team. So we're doing a project called SUSE Storage, which is based on Ceph. And the thing I've been working on the last year is basically Rook, um, which is running Ceph on Kubernetes. So in this talk, I'm going to be talking about three different things. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Ceph, a little bit about Kubernetes, and a little bit about Rook. Um, if anyone is unfamiliar with all of these, uh, unfortunately, I won't be able to go into too much depth. Um, I'm going to talk a bit more about Ceph and Rook than about Kubernetes, because Kubernetes is a massive topic on its own. Uh, so the first thing I want to talk about is software-defined storage. Um, Ceph is a software-defined storage solution. And software-defined storage is kind of contrasted against traditional storage solutions. So buying a storage array from a vendor is just like a big box full of hard drives. Um, the benefits of software-defined storage is that it's cheaper. Uh, it's more flexible, more adaptable to your storage needs, and it's cloud compatible, which is you can run on public cloud. Um, the downside is that there's more com complexity for you to handle. So the traditional storage solution, so you just buy a box, you plug it in and you have your storage. Um, with something like Ceph, uh, a lot of the work of maintaining it and managing it falls on the system administrator. So there's a bit more of a cognitive load there. Uh, but the benefits are uh, huge. Uh, so Ceph is an open source project, LGPL license. Uh, it's a distributed cluster solution. So um, the, it's based on a bunch of uh, nodes collaborating. Uh, it's massively scalable. And I'll talk a little bit more about how that is and what it means. But basically it means that there's really no theoretical limit for how much you can scale a Ceph cluster, how much storage you can add to it. And it's scalable, meaning that you can add and remove nodes as you need. Um, it's self-healing, so it does a lot of work to automatically detect and route around failures in the cluster. And it runs on commodity hardware or on the public cloud, so it's uh, flexible in that sense as well. Uh, another nice thing about Ceph is that it has a lot of interfaces. So basically any kind of, any way that you could theoretically interact with a storage solution, you can interact with Ceph. So it provides object storage interfaces. So REST APIs like S3. Uh, so it has an API compatible with the Amazon S3 API, uh, the OpenStack Swift API. There's other kind of REST APIs. Uh, you can mount storage on Ceph as block device, so you just mount it as a raw device and format your own file system on top. Uh, and it also provides a file system called CephFS, so it's a POSIX-compatible file system that you can mount as any uh, kind of other file system. And it also provides uh, a library, Librados, which is just a direct uh, interface to the uh, storage cluster. So you can interface with it from your favorite programming language and access the storage that way. Uh, there are also a, a few other things. So it has um, NFS gateway, a Samba gateway, 
things like that. So you, you really you can interface uh, with the cluster from any operating system and any any client. Uh, so Rados is the um, name of the Ceph cluster. So uh, I'm going to go through some of the terms used in Ceph just because, um, yeah, otherwise none of what I'm saying later is going to make sense. So hopefully you can remember some of these. Uh, so yeah, so Rados is the name of the object store cluster. And it's basically a cluster of independent kind of peers that are intelligent in the sense that they have, they don't just do what they're being told by some kind of master node. And they find out what the state of the cluster is and makes decisions based on that. Uh, and uh, there's kind of two main types of uh, nodes in the cluster. Uh, there's storage nodes that have storage, and then there's something called monitors, which are kind of the nodes responsible for create, making sure that everyone is in sync. Um, there, there's more to it, but I'm getting into that later. Um, the secret sauce of Ceph, so to speak, is something called Crush. So this is kind of the theoretical framework that, that's the basis for how Ceph works. And basically Crush is an algorithm used both by clients of the cluster and the cluster itself to figure out where a particular piece of data is or should be in the cluster. Um, and I'm gonna talk a bit about that more, more later. The two main types of nodes in the cluster are called OSDs and MONs. So OSDs are storage daemons. Um, these are, you have one storage daemon per disk. So per SSD or hard drive or NVMe storage um, component. So you can have multiple storage daemons on one node if you have multiple hard drives on it. Uh, the OSDs serve data to clients and they also handle peer-to-peer -peer replication and recovery. So um, when uh, there is a change in the cluster, uh, the OSDs will react to it and sync between each other without any kind of external uh, master node. Uh, and then the MONs are kind of basically maintaining a uh, uh, synchronized database used by the OSDs to share uh, the piece of data that they need to synchronize. So the MONs are completely out of the data path. Um, they, they are not involved in any kind of uh, serving of data, uh, but they're used by the OSDs to synchronize uh, the cluster. And typically you have like three or five of these in a cluster, regardless of size, so to speak. Uh, there are a few other kind of daemons in the Ceph cluster. So there's the managed daemon, which runs services for the cluster. So for example, the dashboard, that I'll show a screenshot later. Uh, there are MDS daemons that handle file system metadata for the CephFS file system. Uh, there's something called Rados gateways, which are the nodes that actually provide the REST APIs that we use to connect using the S3 or Swift APIs and so on. And here's kind of a picture of what the cluster looks like. Um, so the core of the cluster is the Rados object store, which consists of a number of nodes that have OSD daemons running on them. Each OSD maps to a device. And then you have a number of monitor servers that are used by the OSDs in order to, to synchronize. Uh, and then above that, you have a few different nodes providing interfaces to the cluster. And then above that, you have the clients. And the clients can be um, client machines accessing uh, block storage. It can be uh, applications app accessing the object storage, or it can be uh, nodes mapping the CFFS file system as, uh, as a file system. Uh, one key thing about Ceph, or kind of the, the cool thing about Ceph is that there is no single point of failure in the cluster. Uh, so there is no single entry point in the cluster that everything kind of has to go through or uh, there are no bottlenecks in that sense. Um, and clients of the cluster use the crush algorithm that I described before to figure out uh, where the data that they need is or should be. And then they can go directly to those nodes and interact with those nodes uh, directly. 
So basically it works kind of like in my amazing drawing here. Um, you take a piece of data, uh, you use the crush algorithm to figure out uh, where it should be. And then you go to the OSD where it should be. And either if you're reading, you ask the OSD for the piece of data, or if you're writing, you uh, write the data to that OSD. Uh, and kind of the, the reason why it's working like this is that it allows uh, the cluster to scale far beyond what it would be able to if you kind of had to go through uh, some kind of uh, intermediate server. So uh, to dig into that a little bit more, why wouldn't you have kind of a directory server that tells you where the data is located? Um, the problem is that, first of all, uh, doing that means you have to do a two-stage lookup. So you have to contact that server, and then once you get a reply, you have to then go to the server that has the data. Uh, or that server would, like you have, would have a kind of a gateway, and that server will go and find the data and then hand it back to you. Um, this limits scalability. So now you have kind of a, you have to be able to scale those uh, intermediate uh, nodes. And also you have the problem of keeping that directory in sync. So now you have to, for every piece of data that's changing, you have to contact that directory and tell it, uh, okay, now this piece of data is over here. Um, the first idea you, you might have is to do kind of a single step placement, which is you hash the data. So you get a hash, you run the hash function over the data, you get a number that describes, describes it, and then you use that to determine where it should be. Uh, the problem with that is that if the cluster changes, so you add a server, or remove a server, um, everything will kind of shuffle around. So then you would have to have this, you have to pause the cluster and then move everything around in order to put things where they're supposed to be, which would be slower and slower the bigger the cluster would get, and the more often it would change. Uh, so that we don't want. So kind of the trick that uh, Ceph does and kind of the secret within the crush algorithm is to do a two-step placement. Uh, so what you do is you hash the data object into what's called a placement group. And then you decide how to, where those placement groups uh, go uh, independently. So you have kind of, you hash your space of objects into placement groups, and then uh, you place those groups uh, onto servers. Um, the nice thing about this is that you can scale the number of locations for data independently of kind of the hashing. Uh, so you can hash into a number of placement groups and then you can decide that, okay, this particular group of objects should be on three servers. And that means that if one server disappears or goes down, the data is still around on two other servers and the replacement server for the server that went down can use the algorithm to figure out where the data that it's supposed to be is and ask those nodes for the data. Uh, so the, the, the storage nodes can kind of independently of any kind of external control, figure out how to recover from failure. You can also then add and remove storage locations. So when a, a node fails or if there's a new node, you can just decide, okay, so the things that were on that server now have to be somewhere else. And if we have a new node, we can just decide, okay, so these things should now be on the server and we can go and ask the existing places where that data is for the data it needs. So sort of, it sort of looks like this. You hash the object into what's called a placement group ID. And then you run the crush algorithm with the placement group ID and the cluster topology. Um, so that is, which servers there are in the cluster. And the output is uh, a list of names of uh, locations where uh, data is. So this is pretty cool. Um, there's, there's a bit more to it in reality. So the uh, crush map topology um, is actually kind of a tree that you have a lot of control over. So you can uh, mark up your nodes to say, okay, so these nodes are in the same data center or in the same rack. And so we wanna make sure that we spread the data around. So let's say we have three replicas of a piece of data. Um, we wanna make sure that those three replicas aren't on the same rack in the same data center. So that if the rack goes down or the data center goes down, the data is still available somewhere. 
Um, there's a lot of uh, things like that. You can also, so it also keeps track of what kind of storage uh, each OSD has, if it's a SSD or a HD drive. And it then knows if it's fast to access or slow to access. And it can make sure that the kind of the primary location for a piece of data is the SSD one. So you can say, okay, so every data should be on one SSD drive and two HD drives. And the HD drives work as kind of backups for the SSD drive. And there's a lot of things you can do like that. So it's, it's pretty cool in a way. Uh, yeah, I also wanted to show the dashboard. So Ceph comes with this um, user-friendly dashboard. It has integration for Prometheus monitoring. So you have uh, Grafana dashboards um, kind of built into the Ceph dashboard. Uh, you can control a lot of the things that the cluster does directly from the dashboard. Uh, and some of the work that we're doing uh, for kind of the next release of uh, Ceph is to provide more of that functionality within the dashboard, even in the case of running on Kubernetes. So you can control a lot of the fu cluster functionality directly from the dashboard. Uh, so now Kubernetes. Um, yeah, if you don't know what Kubernetes is, uh, this talk is probably not gonna help you that much, but briefly Kubernetes is a container orchestration platform. Um, so, uh, it basically, you take a bunch of containers and you give them to Kubernetes, or you get, take a description of the containers that you want running in your cluster, you give it to Kubernetes, and Kubernetes decides uh, where to spin up and where to spin them down, so to speak. And Kubernetes automatically handles things like yeah, the deployment of um, containers, scaling containers up and down, so you can say, okay, I want 10 replicas of this container, and Kubernetes handles starting them on different nodes and so on and general kind of management. Uh, the one key thing about Kubernetes is that the interface to interacting with Kubernetes is um, uh, declarative. So you define your, the way you want your cluster to look in a bunch of YAML documents. And um, Kubernetes takes these and then figure out, okay, so this is the current state of the cluster. Here's what it should look like. These are the changes I need to do to to make sure that it becomes what it's supposed to be. Uh, it handles things like, yeah, like load balancing, uh, rollouts. So you can do gradual rollout of new, new uh, versions of uh, containers, uh, rollbacks. So if you're encountering problems, you can roll back to a previous solution. And it's uh, self-healing. So in the case of uh, problems or issues, uh, Kubernetes takes care of kind of uh, figuring out how to uh, solve the issues. Uh, it also handles things like uh, secret management and configuration management and things like that. Uh, so Kubernetes comes with a lot of concepts that you kind of have to learn. Um, uh, if you read the uh, original paper describing Kubernetes, it's based on uh, the Google Borg project. So it's a project internal to Google that they use to manage all their uh, deployments internally. Um, and it's kind of meant to be an object-oriented model for um, infrastructure. Um, and so what they do is they come, they've come up with all these concepts that kind of abstractly describes infrastructure. And they're, yeah, I don't know. They're meant to be easy to understand, I think but they're really unique to Kubernetes. So you basically just have to learn them. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know any easy way to get over this other than to actually understand them. Fortunately, there's not too many of them. Anyone who's worked with OpenStack, you know that OpenStack has a bunch of code names for everything. And it's, yeah, you just have to learn what Neutron and Swift and all these things are. Um, it's not quite that bad, I, I feel, with Kubernetes. But anyway, uh, a pod is the basic execution unit of an app. So it's, it's an application. Uh, and a pod consists of one or more containers uh, and any kind of resources needed for that container. So it's, um, let's say you have a container that runs uh, Nginx, for example. Uh, you might have some sidecar containers in the pod together with Nginx that provides things like monitoring. So you made maybe a node exporter for 
uh, Prometheus. And then you also have things like uh, volume attachments or uh, net network attachments, things like that, that tell you how to run this uh, application in the cluster. Uh, a service is the interface to accessing the application from the outside. So it's basically mapping a DNS name to a set of pods uh, and then handling load balancing for uh, the pod. So uh, you use a service to access your application and you might, you don't really know how that access is handled in the back end. And Kubernetes takes care of kind of spinning up and spinning down pods to provide the service uh, that you need. Uh, Kubernetes also has a concept called namespace. So everything in Kubernetes is organized into namespaces. So you can kind of keep things separated. Um, this, so everything that Rook does within Kubernetes is within a, one specific namespace. Um, that's the reason why I mentioned that. And then the final thing, oh, well, and also there's something called volumes, which is storage in uh, Kubernetes. But the final thing I want to mention is the uh, CRDs. So this is the custom resource definitions. And this is what allows uh, you to extend the functionality of Kubernetes. And this is how uh, Rook also extends uh, Kubernetes to provide storage. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much it, I guess. Did I, oh yeah, I forgot to mention controllers as well. It's in there. <laughs> There's a lot of things. So controllers are things that create and manage pods, you could say. So uh, there are these things called daemon sets and replica sets, but basically, these are things used by controllers to uh, create and manage kind of sets of pods. So you have like multiple applications um, that together form a service, for example. Uh, yeah, I don't know if that makes sense. All right, so to talk about storage specifically in Kubernetes. Um, storage in Kubernetes is kind of uh, evolving story, I would say. Um, originally, the idea or the purpose for Kubernetes was to handle stateless services. So containers that spin up or spin down that don't have any internal state, but to rely on some external uh, storage or database to store their the state they need to do their, the work they do. Uh, and this is, as I said, modeled on Google's Borg. And of course, at Google, uh, the storage or the database is provided by Google's proprietary te technology, uh, things like Bigtable and Spanner. Um, so storage was never really part of the design of Kubernetes. And so as people outside of Google had need of storage, um, these kind of interfaces have gradually been added to Kubernetes, but it's still kind of, a, yeah, it's still an evolving story. It's not quite there yet. Uh, so it started out with having something called volume plugins. So Kubernetes has a bunch of plugins that provide storage for different things like um, native storage on various clouds, uh, local storage that's on nodes uh, and so on. And eventually people figured out that they wanted some way to add and remove storage in a more dynamic way instead of having to have all these different kind of plugins. And so the first, th first attempt to solve this was something called flex volumes. Um, and this is basically a scriptable volume. Uh, so you can kind of in a controller define uh, what, what the volume actually does. Um, this is used by Rook uh, uh, in older versions. And um, yeah, it's still, still usable. But uh, the next phase of this was something called CSI or the container storage interface. And this is kind of the current state of the art in Kubernetes. Um, and this is um, kind of a, an abstract interface to storage. And so uh, it makes things a bit more flexible, a bit more uh, user-friendly. And this is also what uh, Rook uses to provide storage for, con for uh, containers in um, in Kubernetes. Um, there's a fourth thing, thing called the log, log, uh, local volume static provisioner. And this was added in Kubernetes 1.14. And it looks likely that 
Rook and other storage solutions are going to move to kind of a model that involves using the uh, LVS, uh, where Kubernetes kind of on its own can figure out uh, what storage uh, or what um, devices, like uh, volume devices, are are available, and then Rook provides kind of the CSI interface on top of that. I, yeah, I, I'm not 100% sure about how this works, but this seems to be where things are going. If you want to know more about Kubernetes than what I've told you now, <laughs> yeah, I would recommend kind of any talk by Kelsey Hightower on YouTube. He's, he's really good. He has a bunch of talks. They're all good. They're all about Kubernetes. Um, I wanted to mention this one in particular. So he has this talk called Kubernetes for Developers. And uh, really the reason why I want to mention it is because uh, after he's done this presentation, he starts taking questions. The first question is, is he gets is, what, what things are Kubernetes not good at? Like, what should you not use Kubernetes for? And his answer is that Kubernetes was designed for stateless services. So really, you shouldn't use it for anything stateful. And you shouldn't run your database in Kubernetes. Uh, and I think that's actually quite true. Uh, in, the, in the case of databases, you really should have your database outside of Kubernetes. Kubernetes just isn't very good at dealing with with state. Um, but I think in the case of general storage, so where, where your application just needs a, a hard drive or a file system to, to write to, um, the interface that Rook provides uh, for storage in Kubernetes is actually pretty good. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's definitely something to keep in mind uh, when thinking about storage and Kubernetes is that Kubernetes itself was designed for stateless services. And there's, there's a lot in there that kind of reveals that that's the case. And uh, so, yeah, uh, take that as you, as you wish <laughs> going forward. Uh, but yeah, so what are, what are these challenges? Or I guess, what's the alternative? So yeah, if you say, okay, so Kubernetes was designed for stateless services. So what, what's the alternative then? If we don't do our storage through Kubernetes, but we're running within Kubernetes, um, what can we do? So uh, one answer might be, okay, so we just use whatever storage uh, our cloud provider provides. Um, uh, there is some issues with that though. Um, one big one is that now you're locked into that particular cloud provider. So if you want to move to another cloud provider, they have a different storage solution that they provide. Uh, if you want to move off the public cloud and move into your own bare metal Kubernetes cluster instead, uh, now you have to figure out how to provide storage uh, that you previously got through the vend the cloud vendor. Um, so it kind of limits you both, like it locks you into a particular vendor, it limits your portability, uh, it limits the uh, connectivity or, well, I guess having storage outside of Kubernetes means that now you have to deal with it in a different way. So you have to deal with the connectivity between K Kubernetes and the storage cluster. And so there's this deployment burden and there's questions like, okay, so who is responsible for the storage? Who's responsible for uh, the Kubernetes cluster? There's, there's a lot of reasons why it might se make sense to say, okay, no, I, I do want to manage all my, all everything for, uh, around my application in one place, so to speak. Uh, and really, this is where Rook comes in. Uh, so uh, Rook is a cloud-native storage orchestrator. Um, and basically, what that means is that Rook extends Kubernetes with a set of new primitives for storage. And it configures and manages storage providers in Kubernetes and exposes storage to pods. So it provides uh, a general storage interface. So yeah, so it uses the CSI or the flex volume interfaces in, in Kubernetes to provide storage to pods. Uh, and it does this using a variety of different storage implementations. Um, so the main ones that are in Rook are Ceph and EdgeFS. So in the current version, which is Rook 1.2, um, Ceph and EdgeFS are considered stable. Uh, but there are also implementations for a number of other uh, storage solutions, um, but they're all in various states, states of beta or alpha quality, so to speak. 
the only one I'm going to talk about is Ceph because that's the one that I work with. Rook provides automation for a number of different aspects of storage management. Uh, it handles deployment, configuration, uh, bootstrapping, provisioning, scaling, upgrading, migration, disaster recovery, monitoring, resource management. Um, and it uses whatever facilities are provided by the uh, uh, container manager, like, uh, like, yeah, like Kubernetes, uh, to do what it needs to do. Uh, but the idea is to make storage management as simple and painless as possible. Uh, the main component of Rook that does all this is called an operator. Uh, so the operator is uh, basically a pod which bootstraps and monitors the storage cluster for you. Uh, it manages all the Ceph uh, daemons like the mons and the OSDs. Uh, it creates all the custom uh, resource definitions that you need for things like, like object stores, uh, file systems, um, block devices, and it creates uh, Rook agents. So uh, the other part of Rook is these agents that run on all the nodes and handle any kind of physical uh, storage needs that you have. So it formats and mounts volumes and attaches network storage, things like that. Um, the way in more detail how volumes work in um, in Kubernetes is that you have something called a persistent volume. So this is a volume that persists beyond the lifetime of any given pod. And it, it kind of maps to an actual slice of storage. So you would say, okay, so I need a persistent volume of one gigabyte, or like I have a persistent volume of one gigabyte. Um, persistent volumes can be either manually provisioned by an administrator of, of Kubernetes through the, they define them in the uh, YAML files, so to speak. Or it can be dynamically provisioned by storage classes like those provided by Rook. Um, the way you map those into pods is through something called persistent volume claims or PVCs. So the pod will, in its definition, have a request for storage. So you say, okay, so this pod needs persistent storage, uh, one gigabyte, for example. So yeah, so this application needs one gigabyte storage to run, and Kubernetes takes care of mapping those claims to the actual persistent volumes that exist. Um, you can request based on size, um, access needs. So if you read, need read-only, rewrite, write-only, uh, things like that. And then finally, the storage classes defines the types of storage that are available. Uh, and this is the storage classes is what enables the dynamic storage provisioning. Um, and yeah, so that's that's how that all works. And this is kind of a an overview of how it all comes together. So you have on the left side you have Kubernetes and the Kubernetes APIs, and on the right side you have the things provided by Rook. So you have the Rook operator, um, you have clients that access the Ceph storage, and you have uh, the daemons that make up Ceph. And they're all running within Kubernetes. Uh, so this is kind of how it all comes together. So there, is a, there are a few different use cases for Rook. Um, the first one would be to just have a dedicated Kubernetes cluster for running Ceph. So configuring and managing Ceph can be complicated. I mean, it's a, it's a full-on cluster of uh, of demons that need to be administered, and if you're if you're already a Kubernetes administrator and you're com you're familiar and comfortable with that, then if you want to have a Ceph cluster, maybe not even for uh, workloads that are running in inside of Kubernetes, or maybe you have an existing Kubernetes application cluster, but you don't want to mix in um, the storage into the same cluster, you can have a dedicated Kubernetes cluster that runs Ceph, and then it can serve other clusters with storage. Um, this isn't too common. Uh, I think if you asked Kelsey Hightower, uh, I don't want to speak for him, but it's the impression I got. If you ask him, he would say that 
this is probably what you want to do. You want to separate your storage and your uh, stateless applications. Um, but in my experience and in our experience, uh, we don't see this too much. Uh, more commonly, what you see is a shared cluster where you have one uh, Kubernetes cluster, and maybe you have um, a cluster where you partition the nodes so that some nodes in the cluster are dedicated to storage using Ceph, and some nodes are dedicated to running applications. Uh, and the way you would do this labeling uh, the different nodes and making sure that uh, Rook only uses some of the nodes and your applications only run on other nodes. There is also the option of just running one cluster and letting Kubernetes taking care of, of uh, scheduling things on there. And actually, this is kind of the most common use case that we see so far. Uh, but it, it is also, I don't know, personally, I think that it's a little bit scary <laughs> because, yeah, you're mixing uh, your storage, which is very critical in the sense that um, if you lose your storage, you lose your, your data. And then you're mixing it with applications that may be, in, let's say in the case of you having, you're administering a cluster that runs workloads that come from uh, developers within your organization or whatever. Uh, maybe all of them aren't perfect. Maybe there's some issues sometimes. Uh, and now you're kind of, you're risking things a bit by, <laughs> by mixing these things on the same nodes. I don't know. Um, but yeah, this is the most common solution that we're seeing. Uh, there's one final use case that Rook can handle, and that's the case where you already have a Ceph cluster, or if, you're, if you really want to run your Ceph cluster and administer it yourself, uh, you can uh, use Rook to provide an interface for, for your Ceph cluster within Kubernetes. So you can access the storage provided by the, uh, the Ceph cluster through your Kubernetes applications using Rook, even though the Ceph cluster itself isn't managed by Rook. Uh, and this was added in uh, Rook 1.1, so it's relatively recent. All right, so in order to try this out, so if you want to try Rook, what you need is basically you need a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, you should be running version 1.12 or newer. Uh, it might even be 1.13 on newer with the latest releases. Uh, I probably should have updated that slide. Um, and you need something of the following. So you need some devices on your nodes that run Kubernetes uh, that has storage, but there aren't partitioned or don't have file system on them. Or you can have a bunch of raw partitions without file system on them. Uh, or you can have other kinds of um, uh, persistent volumes within Kubernetes that provide block storage. So the storage class of these PVs are in block mode. Um, and that's, that's what Rook can use to provide this thing. Uh, so I'm gonna run a little animation just to show how easy it is to try this if you already have a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, <laughs> that's, yeah, I know, it's not a, it's not a small uh, prerequisite, but anyway. So all you have to do is uh, clone the Git, the Git repo for Rook. And within the Git repo, there's a bunch of example configurations provided. So you can go to cluster examples, Kubernetes Ceph. And within there, there are a bunch of YAML files. And so the first of these are pretty straightforward. Um, you have common.yaml, which is just a bunch of common functionality used by Rook. Uh, you then run operator.yaml, which deploys the Rook operator. And then you run cluster.yaml, which tells the operator what kind of Ceph cluster you want. Um, and then it, it doesn't spin up quite this quickly, but uh, in real life. But uh, uh, yeah, then you can look at your newly created cluster and hopefully everything is up and running. Uh, so it really is that simple. Um, so the common.yaml, uh, just creates the basic resources used by Rook. Uh, the only reason you would need to edit this is that if you wanna deploy Rook in a different namespace. By default, it deploys into a namespace called Rook Ceph. Uh, let's say if you had multiple Rook instances within the same Kubernetes cluster, you might wanna rename this, but really I don't think it's too common to have to do this. Um, 
the next file that you will want to look at is the operator.yaml. Uh, in this uh, file, you can change some options for the operator, things like the log level, so how much it logs, uh, various feature flags, so you can turn on and off things like the CFFS support, um, yeah, support for flex volumes or CSI, things like this. Um, you can also, instead of using these um, YAML files directly, use the Rook Helm chart. So within the Rook repository, there is a Helm chart provided. So if you use Helm, um, you can use that to deploy Rook. And I haven't done this too much myself, but my understanding is that Helm also helps you with upgrading. So there's a bit of manual work that you need to do when you're upgrading from one version of Rook to the next. Um, and uh, Helm makes that a bit easier. Uh, on the other hand, you have kind of the, the complexity of Helm on top. So that's a trade-off. Um, if you don't know what Helm is, Helm is kind of a package manager for Rook. So it just provides uh, all the YAML files for deploying different things through a, a bit nicer interface. So you can just say, okay, spin up Nginx for me uh, with these parameters. And uh, Helm takes care of creating the YAML files and applying them to Kubernetes. Right, so the file that you might have to edit or probably do have to edit if, if you want to spin up a uh, Rook Ceph cluster is the cluster.yaml file. And this is the file that defines um, which nodes in the cluster and which devices to use uh, to provide storage. By default, these tr uh, Rook tries to use all the nodes in the cluster and all of the devices on those nodes. Uh, and all of the devices means all the devices that it determines are not used by the operating system or not mounted and so on. So any unmounted, unused uh, devices are deemed to be available for storage. You can limit this in different ways. You can as I said before, you can label nodes and then say, okay, so only use the nodes with this particular label. Uh, you can limit the devices used to devices with a certain path. Uh, you can specify exactly which devices to use on which nodes and so on. So there's a lot of flexibility there. Uh, this file also defines how many of each type of uh, uh, Ceph daemon to deploy. So how many mons. Mons are the daemons used to synchronize between uh, nodes in the um, Ceph cluster. And as I said before, you typically have three or five. So by default, uh, the cluster YAML defines three of these. But if you're doing kind of a small test, you might only want one. Uh, so you can do that. Uh, managers are the nodes providing uh, extra services like monitoring uh, and uh, the dashboard. And the gateways are the REST gateways, things like that. Uh, and then uh, you can also deploy optional services like, yeah, like Prometheus, uh, things like that. You also define which version of Ceph to deploy in this file. Um, once you have your cluster up and running, you can add additional services to it. So in this example, we're creating an object store. So an object store is um, kind of the S3 uh, interface that you can use to access um, storage. And then you just create it with the file and then uh, wait for the pod to appear. Uh, and since this one is not too big and not too complicated, I thought I could show you what it looks like. Uh, so you have something called the Ceph object store. Uh, you give it a name, you say which namespace to put it in. It's almost always Rook Ceph. Um, you say, okay, so we want uh, three replicated instances. Uh, we want erasure coding. So it means um, the data that we store within uh, the object store should be replicated uh, over in three places with uh, two data chunks and one coding chunk. Uh, I'm not going to go into erasure coding too much. Um, there's other options. So you can say, okay, so which port to provide and so on. Uh, uh, which port to provide the storage on. And the dashboard is very simple to turn on. It's just a Boolean flag in the cluster, the YAML. You say enable the dashboard and then Rook will spin up the dashboard service and you can get the uh, IP import to access on. Um, 
Rook also comes with a toolbox. So the toolbox is uh, a pod where you have all of the tooling for Ceph available. So if you want to do debugging or you want to make sure that the Ceph cluster is running as it should, or you, know, you just want you need to dig into the cluster manually, uh, you can use spin up a toolbox and then you can jump into it using this command, and you can you have access to all of the Ceph commands that you would expect. There's a lot more to Rook than this. Uh, as I said earlier, Rook provides storage interfaces not just for Ceph, but also for EdgeFS and a bunch of other storage solutions. Um, for more information about Rook and the documentation, you can go to rook.io. So in conclusion, I guess the question that you might have is, why would I want to use Rook? Um, and my answer would be, if you need storage, that is not database storage, but um, disk storage for your applications, and you're running on Kubernetes, there really isn't anything else that compares to this. Um, Rook provides storage within Kubernetes. It provides a consistent interface wherever you run Kubernetes. So if you move between cloud providers, you have the same interface. If you move off of your cloud providers to a bare metal deployment, you have the same interface and so on. So it provides a unified, simple interface to storage in Maribo. And as I said before, all of the benefits of Ceph still apply. So it's, it's highly scalable. It will scale according to your needs um, and, and so on. Uh, the most recent version released of Rook as of today is 1.2.7. Uh, and the Ceph backend is definitely the most mature. So the Ceph backend is the one that I would sort of recommend. It's um, yeah, it's the one I would say is in production uh, quality. Uh, Ceph itself is definitely proven technology. It's been running in production since 2012, used in all kinds of locations. Rook is a bit younger than that, so keep that in mind uh, if you want to be conservative. Um, and finally, I want to mention that uh, SUSE, which is uh, my employer. Uh, provides uh, a productized version and supported version of uh, Ceph and now also Rook. Um, we have in the current version that's released, SUSE Storage 6, we have uh, this available on Kubernetes as a technology preview. Uh, and the goal is for the next version, which is going to be SUSE Storage 7, to have full support for, uh, for running on Kubernetes. And uh, that's it for me. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll be happy to take questions. All right. Thanks a lot, Christopher. This is Tobias from uh, Foss North. I have been uh, watching the uh, question box that we have at Slido, and there have been uh, a bunch of questions that uh, I hope you will be able to, to answer for us. Uh, first is um, not so much a question, but more of a thank you for from a guy, Drew Fustini, who was excited to learn about Ceph. Uh, and then um, the thank uh, you. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> uh, the first question, otherwise, the top one, so to speak, is uh, how stable is Rook? Will it be able to handle enterprise size with, say, 300 developers using it on a daily basis? It's a question from Gina. Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, I would say, like, officially, if you ask me, uh, as my role as uh, a SUSE employee <laughs> delivering SUSE storage, um, as I said, the version that we have out now is a technology preview, and uh, that means we don't support it for production. Um, we are getting close to releasing SUSE Storage 7, which means that if everything goes as it should, uh, I would say that yes, we'd, we've determined that it is ready for production. Um, we're not quite there yet. <laughs> um, if I guess it depends on how brave you feel. Um, storage is one of those topics where uh, you really don't want things to go wrong. Um, you don't want to lose your data. And Kubernetes is changing very quickly. Uh, Rook is a relatively young project. Um, Ceph itself is mature. Uh, it is complicated. So there are still ways to mess up. Uh, there, to actually lose your data in Ceph is quite difficult. 
Uh, but yeah, I, I'm, I don't know if I want to say that, yes, sure, Rook is production ready. You can go and use it today and you'll be fine. Uh, it is, it is quite, quite fresh still, <laughs> I would say, but it's getting there. It's getting close. All right. Maybe there's, there's a related question here that might uh, put, it, put it in a different light. What's the largest deployment of Rook that you've worked on? And is it a customer self-hosted thing or is it something that SUSE runs? So definitely the largest cluster that I've been involved in is customer run. Um, and exactly how big it is, I couldn't tell you. Um, we, yeah, we don't have any out in production already, I think. I, I have to confess that I'm, I'm a developer. <laughs> I'm kind of on the uh, development side of things. I'm not that involved in actual deployments. So I don't know for sure what the actual status of things are right now. Um, when it comes to Ceph, we have some really big deployments. I, again, I don't know the exact sizes, but we're talking thousands and tens of thousands of nodes and massive amounts of storage. Uh, running Ceph through Rook on Kubernetes, I don't know of any kind of additional bottlenecks or issues there um, that you might want to look out for. But yeah, I, I can't say that I've seen anything in the thousands yet. I wouldn't say so. So there, yeah, not not nothing huge yet. I would say. Maybe it's coming with the next version. Then, if if people deploy it, probably yes. We, ha we have another question from Gina here. Um, how big is the community around Rook? Uh, it's fairly big. So there are, I would say that there are three main companies that are kind of contributing to Rook or working on Rook. One is SUSE, uh, the other is Red Hat. And uh, the final one is Upbound, which is the company that kind of created Rook. Um, so, and the number of people involved, so core, I would say is maybe, 10, 15 people working actively, like as their day jobs working on Rook. Um, but the community is much larger than that. So there are a lot of people involved um, that are kind of, yeah, it's an open source project. There are contributors from just, just private people or companies or whatever. Yeah, nice. Uh, and all, uh, the last question for, for this talk is uh, related to the question that uh, was given to Mr. Hightower uh, what are things that Rook is not good for? Ah, um, that is a good question. Um, I would say probably the same things that Ceph aren't, isn't good for. So Ceph is great if you need kind of the infinite scalability um, or, you know, you, ne you need to be able to scale up in the future and so on. If you don't have that need, then Ceph is overly complicated. Um, and that is probably true of Rook as well. So if you don't need the, the benefits that Rook provides, um, you probably don't need Rook either. Um, I mean, if you have only a few applications that you deploy and they don't have much storage needs and they aren't too complicated, then moving to a different cloud and rewriting to use the different clouds uh, storage uh, wouldn't be too difficult probably. Um, if you don't have a need for storage in that way you use a database and you have all your data stored in a database and you manage that separately then you don't need rook as well either so yeah i would say look at the look at ceph and look at what ceph is designed for and think about whether your use case matches that my answer. all right great thanks and uh, thank you again for a great talk uh, it's been super interesting to to follow and uh, I will uh, hand back to Johan. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and we have five more minutes left until the next speaker. So stay tuned and uh, we'll see you around. And with that, I would like to thank our speakers, our sponsors, and all our viewers 